Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Fear Feeding Friday. My name is Lena. I'm Lynn. And we are back with another episode for you guys. Today, we are doing Canada's most notorious serial killer. We are back with Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka. They are known to us as the rapist killer. And of course, Carla is now living in Montreal slash Ottawa, wherever the heck she ends up. I'm sure people will find her, but we're gonna call them the deadly combo because that's what they are. It's interesting how like you think that with certain people with like a good childhood, they wouldn't end up becoming serial killer because we're always, I guess we're always known to the like it's more known that people with like um, tough uh, childhoods tend to go that route, <laughs> but it's very rare to find. Oh, I guess it might not be so rare. Maybe we just don't hear about it about people who grow up normally in a loving uh, family that turn into killers. Well, this is true now. Um, so as far as we know, okay, let's start with Paul. Paul is actually known as the Scarborough Rapist, which is kind of creepy because Scarborough is already known for his crime. And so the fact that he is the Gar- Scarborough Rapist is already like, ew. He's known as the Scarborough Rapist and a schoolgirl killer, which is also kind of gross, but whatever. Like, ugh, irks me when I hear that. But Paul was born on August 27th, 1964 in Scarborough, Ontario, Canada. And he was born into a very well-off family. Um, he had both a mother and a father, and apparently he had a really nice childhood. He was born with all the greatness. And Carla was actually born on May 4th, 1970 in Mississauga, Canada. According to um, this book called Lethal Marriage, written by Nick Pon, <laughs> young Bernardo was described as a very happy child. He smiled a lot, and he was also very cute with his dimples and good looks and sweet smile. Many of the mothers just wanted to pinch his uh, to pinch him on the cheek whenever they saw him. He was like the perfect child that they all wanted. Ha! Little do they know. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> well mannered, doing well in school, so sweet that um, so sweet in his uh, Boy Scout uniform, quote unquote, which is really creepy that they said that. But okay, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. But obviously, we know that Bernardo had developed a very dark sexual. Um, fantasies and enjoys humiliating women in public and beating the woman he dated and this kind of starts back with like his parents um, because we later on find out that his father Kenneth a fond old girl and was charged with child molestation in 1975 I guess that was the start of his like weird fucked up ways I don't know Mm -hmm. I don't know but He was also sexually abusing his daughter, which is also uh, Paul's sister. And at some point, I guess his mom had gone to a depression, I guess giving like, this is the man she married and this is what he's doing to her family and what have you, that she had withdrawal from her duties to her family and lived separately from them in, in their basement, in their basement. She did her own thing, just didn't really care for Paul, didn't really take care of her own family. Kind of weird that she chose the basement, though. Right? Isn't it really creepy? I was like, mm, okay, sure, why would you want to live in a basement? Oh, like, I guess, like, what boggles my mind more is, like, why wouldn't you just move out altogether? Because it mm-hmm. sounds like she was able to, she was obviously living a separate life now and doing her own thing and, I guess, thriving if she was. I wasn't sure if she is, but we'll, we'll pretend she was thriving and living well. Paul had eventually found out that his mother had had an affair and Paul, who he thought was his father, isn't actually his father. Mm. So it makes me wonder where does this weird sexual fantasy comes from? Because it would have made sense had his father, Kenneth, had been his real father. Because obviously he's pretty fucked up himself and he's molesting his own daughter and funneling mm-hmm. other girls that when he shouldn't be mm-hmm. at all period well and, i guess that this is one of those things where um nurture went over nature right mm. so like who knows that might be it be, being raised in um by a man who was like that he turned into that man also worse 
This is well, this is true now. <gasps> Let's pause for 2.5 seconds. We forgot to tell our listeners are doing Starbucks again today. <laughs> <laughs> We forgot our, uh, the second part of our segment. So I am doing Starbucks with a venti size chai cream frappuccino with soy milk and chocolate chips. Delicious. Oh. And a cheese danish to go with it. I got, I also got a cheese danish and I got an iced chai latte in a venti. Ooh. Um, just regular milk. <laughs> Ooh. So when he was growing up, he was essentially like, what we consider as an all Canadian boy. Like he, I guess he was great at everything. He was great in school and he ended up becoming an accountant. Oh, well, you missed one more thing about Paul, which was that he, at a young age, he was a peeping Tom. I tried so smart to smart forget that. Also kind of, that was also like kind of creepy considering like he started that when he was a child. <laughs> and it's even more creepy that like, cause you know how we always find like children ghosts is always creepy. Yeah. Imagine like looking outside and see like a young boy staring right back at you and touching himself. Ugh. Like that's, that's so hello gross. creepy and gross. But, like, but I think like I find that more creepy versus gross. Like that would be my me thought because I'd be like, why is this boy outside my window? Like that's so creepy. And where is this? Well, it's, it's like it's normal for like boys who reach like, you know, preteen years to start like, you know, getting, um, interested in those kind of things but like usually they don't go to the extent where they're like peeping at people well like that was like that's a different like thing altogether right usually they're like figuring out their own bodies first but he decided that he's gonna watch people first <laughs> yeah that's really creepy like and this is why i'm so glad i do not live in the house i definitely don't want like little creepy paul bernardo's creeping into my windows <laughs> like I can't really imagine it like and I I know I wonder if he was ever caught well and I'm, wait, I'm, where did the information about him being a peeping Tom come up though because if it's someone obviously if it's someone giving their the information that means that uh, he was caught at some point <laughs> he could have given that information in that file that they wrote about him oh yeah the Barbie doll they were okay. actually they were actually called like um the barbie and ken killer because of how good looking they were oh yes yes i remember that they were called mm -hmm. that and they actually did look like barbie and ken i'm not gonna lie <laughs> like it's not with like the crazy proportions <laughs> yeah just not the crazy proportion yeah they were just very good looking people I, apparently i mean i didn't find him i guess like in in like back in the day standards they were really good looking mm -hmm. well the, you have to remember like sometimes like photos don't like do very well back then either from like old photos mm. i mean like, have mm. you seen carla now she did not age well <laughs> maybe she tried plastic surgery i don't know <laughs> well she clearly did not do a very good job because <laughs> i didn't say she did good plastic surgery <laughs> that was terrible so carla grew up in st Catharines with both parents who are still married uh she had two sisters um one um both of them are actually younger than her she's she was the oldest um mm -hmm. and had a very privileged upbringing mm -hmm. she's very outgoing and bright and loved playing with barbies of course of course yeah, <laughs> yeah she went from being very popular uh to dark also she worked at the local vet like well, her working at the vet is important because mm -hmm. that's essentially how she was led into attaining these medication that would mm -hmm. essentially kill his her own sister mm -hmm. she's fucked up like that yeah and there is a book out there called carly um finding uh, carla and there's a mm -hmm. movie out there called carla which is quite interesting because she's milking all of um, this for all she can mm. probably still getting loyalty off of it too i still wonder book. like sometimes i still wonder like I wonder how her kids feel about all this. You know, I definitely wonder about that. And I wonder how much of it do they know? And if they mm -hmm. ever consider actually Googling their parents or, well, not their parents, her, their mom. Mm. If they and ever know her real name. Well, that too, right? Because she changes so many times. Um, and also what I'm interested in about too is the lawyer, whose brother is also a lawyer, that she ended up marrying. What? 
was it that he was like, yeah, I could see you and I together in a future. Let's do this. Like, Let's I, have some kids too while we're at it. <laughs> right. Like, I genuinely wonder the thought process behind it. Like, I, get, I mean, I get, the, I get the saying that goes like you can't choose who you fall for, but I guess at the same time, given that he is a lawyer himself, and he does deal with a lot of criminals that does he like not shy away from it or does he just really enjoy living dangerously and it's like yeah let me date her or he maybe just like fell for all the lies that she said maybe Mm -hmm. this is true now small facts of carla and paul they were born like five years apart on literally opposite ends of the city which is kind of funny (laughs) but on October 1987, Paul met Carla when she was in Toronto attending a conference for the vet. And so this is where I said, like, the vet, her working at the vet was very important because um, this is later on would kind of lead into, like, a whole world of how her and Paul came together and how she essentially, like, ended up stealing drugs from the vet to commit murders and such. And the moment they met, they were, like, immediately attracted to each other. And they were, like, constantly at it, nonstop. And what's even interesting is, like, I in the movie, Carla, she, I guess, like, this obviously must have, like, they must have had discussion with the real Carla. But from mm-hmm. what I understood um, in the movie, and obviously in the movie, it's obviously going to be exaggerated, but the, in, there's a scene where they're, uh, her and her friend are eating at the hotel downstairs, and mm-hmm. Paul and his friend pulls up. And the moment she saw him, she was like, oh, yeah that man i definitely want him and they come in and they made a beeline to their table and they all sat down later on after like you know they introduced himself and what have you the next scene cuts into carla and paul um opening up their hotel room like well carla's hotel room and they're going at it like wild animals and then right and then their friend comes into the room and it is making it awkward because now at this point they look like they're about to have, you know, mm-hmm. sexual intercourse. Wow, I don't know why I said that. They're about to have sex. And, um, and in the scene, the friends were like, well, this is so awkward. Like, what, what are you doing? So Paul turns mm-hmm. to them and says, well, if you're not going to join in or something along those lines, then you know what, then leave, right? And then obviously the, the scene cues out. And I think, did those friends actually sat there and watch the whole thing? Because they didn't look like they were making a run for it at any given point. <laughs> and I was, yeah, it was really weird. As I was watching this movie, I'm like, um, I'm sorry. If my friend was having sexual intercourse at this very moment, the first second I'm thinking is to leave. But his friend and her friend just end up sitting in the room and just stare at them. Mm. At least that's how the scene ended. And then, Interesting. Yeah, it's quite interesting, and, like, I'm just thinking, okay, hmm. Well, hopefully that's a little more of an exaggerated part, because, like, yeah, that's, that's what I'm hoping. weird. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I'm hoping. Like, yeah. that's, that's really, 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 really creepy, but, yeah. yeah. So, she was 17, and he was 23, obviously, when they met, so she was obviously underage. You, we know he likes some mm. young. But before he met Carla, Paul was actually already slowly becoming the Scarborough Rapist. From May 4th to uh, May 4th, 1987 till July 1990, he was out and about and attempting rapes and raping young women in Scarborough. Now, obviously, these are just the ones that were found and reported. For all we know, he could have, like... Well, he didn't kill these women. Um, no. So, I think it was just, like, they, they tied it in with like the same rapist because it was like I'm sure like there were like descriptions from the victims Mm. um so that's how they tied it to the same person here's a kicker of the whole thing around the time he met Carla there was a poster drawn up by one of the victims Mm. and it looked a lot like Paul and the police actually brought Paul in to question him they took his DNA they took his you know like his fingerprint and and all that stuff but because, and this is where it irks me, because he seemed like such a nice, charming guy, they didn't think that they should check his DNA right away. So they took his sample, let him go, be on his merry way, where he obviously continued doing what he was doing. 
and his DNA sat on the shelf for two years, two whole effing years before they decide that, oh yeah, that's right. We got this guy some DNA already and fingerprint. We should probably go test it out. Two years. Imagine, the, right? Like those two years full of victims, like that could have been easily prevented had they just not stereotyped the fact that he was charming, he seemed nice, he seemed like this, blah, blah, blah. So that was really annoying. But the victims would range from 15 to 22. And these are, again, like, obviously we don't know if there was any other ones or anything after that. These are just the ones that were known and actually reported. Um, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes people don't want to go out there and, and say anything for they think that it's their fault or what have you. Continue, he would become more and more violent. So it's almost like he's testing his limit uh, with mm-hmm. each incident. And he would, um, he would find stones and stakes and insert, insert them into his victims. Holy mm-hmm. fuck, that's just disgusting. Sometimes he would attack his victims um, again after he had already had finished. Oh, jeez. I know. Oh, and oh. Oh, a, a thing for uh, for virgins. So I don't know how he would figure out that they're virgins or not. I mean, I guess given their age, he would assume they're virgin. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, but he had a thing for virgins, and he was considerably bothered by the fact that Carla wasn't a virgin. Carla's youngest sister looks Tammy looks just like Carla. Like, yeah, pretty much like a mini version of Carla. Mm-hmm. So he began to pressure Carla into arranging a way where he can take her virginity. <sighs> As the fact that we're both sisters. Yeah. And we're sisters to other sisters. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why that thought process was like, yeah, I will give you my sister's virginity. Let's do this. I honestly don't know. Like, some people, apparently, we we can know that some people are just extremely messed up. And apparently, I, was, I feel like her thought process was extremely selfish also. Right. Because, like, she... Like, I know later on, she says, like, she feels bad about it and all that oh. shit, but it's just like, oh, okay. no, it's like, you know, like, you had the choice to make that decision, you know, mm-hmm. you're the one that chose to forfeit up your sister mm-hmm. after thinking, oh, would I rather, like, harm my sister or would I rather break up with this guy? Oh, no, I'd rather harm my sister, which is like. I don't care what she said, but like there's no, there is absolutely nothing that makes sense for her to forfeit up her sister like that. No, absolutely no sense at all. Well, it, like just in general, why would you think that, why would you even consider giving up your own family over some dude, regardless of how hot you think he is or how like and on mm-hmm. top of that i feel like that would be a red flag like if so if a man actually ever said that to me my immediate thought would be like <laughs> well thank you for that i will take that into consideration mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and um i just want to reconfirm your address just in case i want to drop by later and give you my decision all right cool that's your address all right cool cool the moment he leaves that door i'm fucking calling the police yes yeah. Let them know where he's at. Let them know what they just he just said to me. Like, are you kidding me? You can, you're going to be telling me that you're, you, you're totally okay with the fact that he wants your sister. And you're like, yeah, let me give it to you. Let me wrap it up and just give it to you. And so, mm-hmm. of course, she was really, really sick about it. She had this whole thing planned where she wanted to give Tammy to him as a Christmas present. Oh, what? As a Christmas present. Oh, God. Like, could you get more fucked up than that? Let me wrap up my sister and give it to you as a present. Not just any present. A Christmas present. Like, the actual F? Like, I don't know who's worse out of the two of them. But, like, (laughs) I feel like she is. (laughs) Honestly, I... I genuinely feel like she is too, because like, I mean, I'm not saying like, you know, all those other victims don't have family that they don't matter. We're not saying that, Mm -hmm. 
But like, I guess like to think, how do you think it's okay to offer your sister up like that? Mm -hmm. And no, not even bat an eye about it. Not even like have second thought about it. Not even like, yeah, like, yeah. Why would you want my sister when you have me? And don't you love me? Like, why would you want, like it, the whole thing is just pretty effed up, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, and then, this is where she decided that she's going to go ahead and take those drugs. Anesthetic. Yes. She took the anesthetics from the vet, brought it home, and was trying to figure out a way how to give it to her sister without her noticing. Because obviously, her biggest concern is that Tammy's going to rat her out to their parents. Not the fact that she could possibly kill her sister, but the fact mm-hmm. that her sister could possibly rat her out to her parents. So she obviously stole it, brought it home, and was trying to figure out a way how she was going to feed it to her sister. Um, what I wanted to add was, was very fond of her. And again, going back to the movie, mm-hmm. he was very fond of her, and he would hang out with her a lot, and he would flirt with her. And um, Carla wasn't liking that because, you know, even though that's what he wanted was her sister's virginity, he didn't want Paul to be flirting with her sister. So Paul was mm-hmm. hanging out at the family house a lot. And, you know, they were doing their thing. And, t- you know, Tammy thought it was super cute. I guess it was, like, I don't know why she also thought it was okay to be hanging out with her sister's boyfriend as well, too. But she did. Um, she was a child at that time. So she was probably thinking, like, oh, he's going to be my new brother, right? Well, okay, yeah. So she probably wasn't thinking much because at that point, they, Carla and him were engaged. So he's, so at that point, you know, Tammy probably just thought of him as a family member. It was like, oh, yeah, whatever. Like, it's just really creepy because, like, if you've seen videos and photos, she would sit in his lap mm-hmm. and, like, just hang out with him in, like, a weird, like, sister wife kind of situation. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, which is also really weird. But, What's even more creepy is that it Paul was, you know, going back to his peeping Tom ways and would peek into Tammy's room at night. And it got to a point where he would get Carla to unlock Tammy's uh, window so he could sneak into her room at night and wow. watch her sleep while he touched himself. Yeah. I thought her and Carla, Tammy and Carla looked exactly alike. Couldn't he just masturbate to his fiance? Like, I don't understand. Right. And that's it ha- maybe it's the age thing. Well, that's the thing that we, we don't get. Like, like the fact that they look alike, and but he doesn't want her. He wants Tammy. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. Maybe it's the fact that he likes getting Carla jealous, or maybe he's just using Carla. Who knows, right? Like, it was, it's a mm-hmm. really fucked up situation. And that was the part I never understood either, because the fact that, like, they looked alike. Yeah, they looked alike. Like, the only difference was, like, I don't know. It was just really creepy. Anyways, so six months before their wedding, Carla decided to give her boyfriend her sister's virginity. Stealing the uh, anesthetics, she she worked out a way, and she was like, you know what? I'm gonna feed. It, I'm gonna grind it up. I'm gonna put it in her drink, and I'm gonna feed it to her with alcohol. So that way, she'll get drunk and she'll pass out, and then we can have our way with her. They did that, and when it happened, she did pass out. And mm-hmm. after she had passed out, in July, he took Tammy across the border to get beer for a party. Bernardo later on told his fiance that, and I quote, they got drunk and began making out, unquote. So with Mm. that being said of her being like, oh, he's going to be my older brother. I'm sorry. Say what now? You don't make up with your family members. Wasn't Tammy like 12 or something? I think she was 15. 15 actually. Was she 15? I think she was 15. Yeah, she was Oh, yeah, she was, uh, yeah, she was 15. Yeah, so there you go. So, yes, so Tammy was 15, so, but even then, like, so she obviously wasn't that young, and so she's very well aware that if that's your sister's boyfriend, that's your sister's boyfriend or fiancé, whatever. You don't make out mm-hmm. with your sister's fiancé. That's just really creepy. Um, and he mm-hmm. also seemed really obsessed with her, which I also don't understand. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, so the first night on Christmas, right after the parents had gone to bed, they were feeding her egg eggnog and they grind up the drugs and then she had passed out. So when she had passed out, they obviously undressed her 
and Bernardo did his thing with her while they videotaped the whole thing. Because I don't know why, but this couple just really enjoy videotaping, videotaping everything. So they yeah, videotaped. Like the feeling of being watched, I guess. Or like maybe they were like rewatching it later on and have more like mm. actual fantasy towards. I don't know. Now so I'm like, I guess like this is a typical serial killer thing where they, it's, it's their way of trophies. So instead yeah. of keeping like objects, they, they keep like, videos where they can relive the moment over and over and over again which is also mm-hmm. really fucked up yeah showing down this um to janus <laughs> it had cooled down so it wasn't as soft as i expected to be my bad but anyways after she passed out she also like put some corax i think it's corax you know that drugs that like most people use to kidnap people where they put in a cloth um, a cloth and then they put it over your foot mm. So mm-hmm. she got that ready and she put that over her, her sister's face while Bernardo like went down on her, undressed her, did their thing. And at one point she stopped breathing. So she removed the cloth and realized that she had stopped breathing. So they called 911. But then she vomited it and turned over. So then she thought, mm-hmm. okay, like she should be okay now. But then no, no, no. That same night, they end up killing her sister. She had passed out and just never came to because she choked on her own vomit. Oh. Yep. Yep. Very fucked up. Like, yeah, she ended up choking on her vomit, I believe. Yep, she died mm-hmm. on December 24th, 1990. Wow, that sucks. Christmas Eve. Yep. Remember, she was supposed to be Paul's... Uh, Christmas present. Mm -hmm. So fucked up. But the fucked up part is that that's even more fucked up. Actually, no, I don't know what's more fucked up. I don't know. More fucked up shit that she did afterwards was three weeks after her sister had passed away, Mm -hmm. Carla would dress up in Tammy's clothes so that she could entice Paul. That's kind of gross. Mm-hmm. And then to add further to it, she had expressed to her parents that she wanted to keep the wedding date. But obviously her parents were like mourning over the fact that they've lost their daughter. And mm-hmm. at this point, they've deemed the the whole incident as an accident. You know, a teenage girl over drinking, um, mixing drugs with alcohol, end up passing out, end up choking on vomit. Whoopsie. Tragically, but nothing to really be concerned about, right? Not obviously realizing Mm -hmm. that that was no accident. They did this Mm -hmm. to her. So Carla was getting annoyed that her parents wasn't giving her any focus anymore. And it wasn't about her anymore because it's the fact that now it's about her sister. And she did not like that. So with many, many convincing, she managed to convince her her parents to keep the wedding date, that they were still going to get married and do the whole shabam. And she wanted the attention back on her and she wanted to be all about her again. And she like, how, I don't understand that. Like you just killed your sister and you have no remorse over it. And you're mad mm-hmm. at your parents for the fact that they are mourning over their daughter. It's so crazy. Just like how selfish she, she was like, mm-hmm. I'm sure she still is. Mm-hmm. But it's just like, you hear about people like her who are just extremely selfish and she took it really far Mm -hmm. she's such an extreme yeah but now i guess i've been better at this point paul and carla have already gotten married they had the fairytale wedding apparently it was deemed the most beautiful wedding it was like something out of a movie they looked like the perfect couple the barbie and ken doll the works they even had like apparently like a horse carriage she, would, she looked like Cinderella. Mm-hmm. There was this whole big shabam about it. Maybe it's just not our style anymore, but I didn't really see anything special about it. But hey, whatever. Six months later, this couple was back at it. After they killed Carla's sister and had no remorse for the fact that they've done this to her, they decided that they were going to invite a 15-year-old girl who had worked with Carla at the pet store two years earlier for a girl's night out. 
Now, this, this poor girl does not want her identity to be known. So we're just going to call her Jane Doe. After the girls have spent the night, the evening, like, you know, shopping, dining, just having a great time, Carla made Jane Doe the specialty drink. You know, that drink that she fed her sister. And after being knocked unconscious, Carla called her husband, Paul, to let him know that his surprise wedding present was ready. Like, what the actual fuck? What? Like, and so I'm just going to rewind this. In the movie, Carla, she makes it seem like Paul is making her do everything. That Paul is forcing her to do this. And he kept threatening her if, if she didn't do what he wanted, he would leave her and that she loved him so much that she had to do everything he wanted her to do. But it seems like to me she's acting on her own free will. Mm-hmm. I totally agree with that. Because like, no, at the end of the day, no matter how much you love somebody, if it completely goes against like what you truly believe in, that's mm-hmm. right or wrong, you wouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And the fact that she just easily gave up on, like, so many, like, unethical things shows that she didn't have, like, ethics in her mentality to begin with. Like, she had no, yeah, she just had no um, respect for anyone's life or anyone's feelings or anything like that. So They each took turn raping her while they videotaped. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. So they each took turn raping her while they videotaped because that's their favorite thing to do. The next morning, the poor girl woke up and was nauseous and had no idea what had happened to her. She just thought that she was hungover from her first alcoholic drink. Mm. Now, this is where I want to pose a question because we're both being females and all. Mm -hmm. How did she not feel that she was sore down there? And he raped her in both directions. Oh, geez. Um, well, she was 15, right? Mm-hmm. So it could be that she was a virgin and she didn't know that that was the pain coming from being raped, right? Because she was unconscious the whole time. Maybe she just <laughs> thought that she was like sore for some reason, but she doesn't know why yet, right? I mean, yeah, I get that, right? Um, like, what? I think, like, back then, they didn't not, it was, like, the idea of sex wasn't, like, super, um, like, thought about at that point. I mean, that's true, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't know. It, it just makes me wonder, because I guess, like, like, even now, as adults and stuff like that, you know, like, mm-hmm. after we even have consent, sexual intercourse, mm-hmm. we feel it. So, I guess, like... Mm-hmm. The fact that they were really utilizing her body for their sick fantasies, it makes me wonder how she never f- questioned it. And I think also, too, like, instantly and intuitively, she never felt something was off. Mm-hmm. You know, like, that's, a, that's something I, I always question about that. Because, like, not that I'm blaming her for it, don't, don't get us wrong. But I guess I, I just question, like, the fact that us, us you know, like, when something happens to our body, we tend to think, oh, why do I feel that way? Mm-hmm. And you start to question it, but I, I'm surprised that this girl never, I guess, wow. thought about it enough. Yeah, well, like, she was young, right? So even when she, I'm sure, like, when she, like, told about her story, um, like, who knows if she even said the whole thing, right? It's like, it's, I'm sure it was, like, really terrifying when she started talking about it and she just Mm -hmm. didn't tell say everything right she just got down to the basics and like this is what happened right right so it might be that she did she did feel something was off during the when she during that time because at the end of the day we don't know how what she went through nor how she felt when she got up right no for sure right however this is where it gets more messed up Mm -hmm. this poor girl came back for round two in august oh round two so, again, that's why I post that question where I genuinely question intuitively mm-hmm. do not wonder. And, of course, this, again, it's not to say that it was her fault or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, but I guess, like, I'm just, we're, I'm just trying to take it a step back and, like, unpack it, you know, try to, try to understand 
not not that I would we would ever want this to happen to us, but like I guess try to put our mind in their mindset and see what they're seeing, mm-hmm. and try to understand I guess like what they thought what had happened to them, and obviously she, this was this must have been videotaped because I don't think it doesn't sound like she knew what happened to her. So mm-hmm. our guess is that she was obviously brought in after the videotapes were reviewed. Oh. And that's probably why she got questioned. And, you know, like, so I don't really think she actually knew what happened to her. And that's the part that makes me go, what the actual fuck? Mm-hmm. But in August, she came back for round two. And this time she was under the impression that it was a sleepover. So Carla and Paul uh, recreated what happened to Tammy with Jane Doe all over again. However, this yeah. little kid must have nine lives because she survived round two. Oh, I guess at least she lived on one side, so. You know, that's, yeah. that's what I figure. You know, I was like, you know what, you poor thing. I, I, I can only imagine. I you know I wonder too, like, where she is today and what kind of person she turned out to be because mm-hmm. living with something like that cannot be easy at all. Yeah, especially knowing fully well there's a tape of you out there of all the things that have happened to you I wonder if she even watched the tape I really hope not because like I find that it was kind of like a saving grace in her for her in the sense that she didn't remember it in that sense Mm -hmm. right at least she didn't have to go through like like obviously she went through it but like she didn't have to like remember the pain of it during right you know, like, I know that sounds, it, it might, it might be um, a saving grace for some, it might not be for her, like, mm-hmm. I don't know what her mind is, mindset is like, right, when she found out. For sure. Um, I just know, like, for myself, like, if something like that happened to me, and I didn't remember a thing about it, like, I wouldn't think much about it, right, in that sense where um, I won't let it, like, control my mind like there's nothing for me to think back on you know it's like oh I like because I know like a lot of like victims tend to remember like the act during right right they remember their faces during the act and stuff like that and like the horror of it during the act Mm -hmm. so I think like being able not to not remember the during the act part for her might hopefully have helped her during this time and she was able to move on from it and have a happy life. But what if she gets flashback yeah. of traumatic stress from it? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Like, that's just the only thing, right? It's like, who knows? Or, or she starts to question what is reality and what isn't anymore. Mm-hmm. It's like the mind is such a sensitive thing, right? So mm-hmm. it's hard to say. We're going to take it back just a little. This couple was definitely busy after they got married. Eight days after their encounter with Jane Doe, Pa found a new victim. Uh, Leslie Mahaffey, while he was going through Burlington stealing license plates. (laughs) He's to be sorry to stealing license plates. Yep. Okay. (laughs) Oh, I think we we missed the part where he lost his job earlier. Oh, that's right. Many years ago. So we we missed the part where he actually lost his accounting job before um, Tammy passed away. And I guess he just never got back to it. No, and he also kept back hush hush. He never told uh, Carla's family. I don't even think mm -hmm. he told Carla. He would do the, you know, that typical, like, I'm going to pretend I'm going to work and then spend Mm. his days doing whatever he was doing and then come back at night. Yeah. yeah, So so I totally forgot all about that. Yeah, he actually, he was smuggling um, cigars or something like that between uh, Canada and U.S. Mm. Um, during that time. Mm. And I guess uh, at this point, after after Tammy's death, he is now stealing lessons plates. So, moving on. Uh, <laughs> Leslie was 14 at the time. Um, and she had just missed curfew, so she was trying to think of a way to sneak into her house. Paul approached her with, hey, hey, I'm going to try and bring you to the neighbor's house at two o'clock in the morning. Very creepy. I think it's like, I feel like a lot of, um, a lot of like the things that we grew up with about like stranger danger kind of thing, like probably started after they, after him, after Paul, because like, I remember, because like, 
this all happened in the early 90s or like mm. around there right early 90s late 80s yeah late 80s early 90s and that was right around when we were born and I remembered growing up and we would see like a lot of commercials talking about like be careful of strangers and stuff like that you know mm-hmm. and like growing up all the parents were all like be careful of strangers like if people if someone comes up to you like this blah blah don't talk to them and like I don't know if it's all I can't imagine that I was always like that because I feel like when you think back on it like not everyone grew up thinking like oh you need to be wary of strangers some mm-hmm. of them grew up with like oh yeah like be kind and whatever just like mm-hmm. it didn't matter who um I so I think I feel like we like I feel like Canada kind of exploded at that point when uh this the whole thing with him was ha- happening where he was like going after all these young women and that's when you know oh yeah Canada was like I'm we're going to inform everyone don't talk to strangers don't get in yeah. their cars don't get in don't go to their homes and like be wary of everything and and, like don't travel alone um Mm -hmm. also like he was really creepy too like how he picked out his victims when he was in scarborough was that Mm -hmm. he would watch the buses go by and obviously you can see into the buses and see who was on the buses right so he would Mm -hmm. find essentially women that were traveling alone and then he would then approach them and that's how a lot of them end up becoming his victims but um yeah so he had approached um leslie and made a joke, but obviously, I'm surprised she didn't think that was really creepy, especially that early in the morning. That someone mm-hmm. being like, "Oh, I want to break into your neighbor's house, hearty har har." But apparently, <laughs> <laughs> according to this side of the story, she pretty much gave him the resting bitch face and asked for a cigarette. So obviously, um, as they went to his car to get these cigarettes, he then blindfolded her and forced her into his car and kidnapped her. Because mm-hmm. that's exactly what would happen if you decide to go to a stranger's car. And mm-hmm. he drove to uh, Port Dalhousie, yeah. And that was where then he informed Carla that they had a new victim. Apparently, the reason why Lesia came home late that night was because she was actually attending a wake for her uh, friend, Chris Evans. Uh, rest <laughs> in peace, you know, rest in peace. Um, mm-hmm. So this boy had actually passed away due to a car accident earlier that week. So it's a, such a traumatic week for her too, poor girl. And after the wake, her and a large group of like, I guess other teens had gone into the woods to drink and to console one another. So after afterwards, a, a couple of her friends had walked her home and they had come home uh, shortly before 2 a.m. in the morning. They stayed with her, but um, that's when she found out that the side door of her house was locked. And she essentially told her friends, ah, it's cool, like I'm, I'm sure the front door will be unlocked. Like you don't have to worry about me. So she sent them home. And after she um, they left her, she also found out that the front door was also locked. So definitely regretting the fact that she sent her friends home because now she's alone. She had walked to a payphone at Max. Interesting. So anyway, she had called her friend's house and to ask for permission to sleep over. I'm surprised that her friend was even awake at this point. But mm-hmm. sadly, her friend had actually turned her down and told her no. Um, so they obviously had a lengthy conversation for quite some time. And she had returned home after 2.30. So it was a, mm-hmm. I don't know, a good 20-minute conversation. And um, she told her friend, you know, not to worry about her. She's just going to go home and try to wake up her mom and deal with the consequences of being late, whatever. It is what it is at this point. So, she, you know, when she had gone back to the house, that is when Paul had approached her. So I guess he must have been mm-hmm. watching her and noticed that she was alone. I always but, just, what I don't understand is, like, A, like, wouldn't you be worried about your child being outside that late at night to begin with? Because I know that my mom would always stay up if I was ever that late. You know? Um, I, I think 100%. I think, like, I think kind of going back to what you were saying earlier, where um, back then, Canada didn't have, like, a, a serial killer like this. We didn't even know what a serial killer was. And mm-hmm. we didn't even know what a definition of a serial killer was. And... Mm-hmm. And so I guess at that point, there wasn't, like, a lot of crimes or anything like that. So they felt, for the most part, you know, things were safe. So they didn't really think about them is what my prediction would be. And I guess after mm-hmm. him is when all the, you know, stranger danger, um, always walk in pair kind of came to be. Yeah. Along with, obviously, with a bunch of other crime that occur after um, Paul Bernardo and 
his crazy Barbie girlfriend wife, mm-hmm. Jonathan, whatever. <clears throat> but um, yeah, so I think that's probably why, like at that time, her parents didn't really think too much about it. But I don't know. But at that point, like there were, at that point, like it's been going on for a while that like Paul was going around raping women. It's so true now. So it's like. Oh. It's, oh, I guess. Well, I, I guess it's like that mindset where it was like, oh, like, um, it won't ever happen to like my family, kind of thing, maybe. Because I know there a lot of people still think that way, where like they hear terrible news, but they, they but a lot of people's mindset is like, oh, that won't happen to us. Well, that right? and also they weren't in Scarborough, right? Because at that time he was mm-hmm. a Scarborough rapist, so they just assumed that um, if you're in Scarborough, mm-hmm. you're targeted. It wasn't so much of like other cities, right? Because like um, he he didn't really um, hit up anyone in Toronto per se. He didn't really mm-hmm. hit up anyone in Mississauga either. I mean, he made up like, again, like we don't really know all the victims that had unfortunately crossed his path, but, yeah. but you know, the ones that were known were all from Scarborough. Right. So my prediction is that kind of like going back to your, what you said earlier with the mentality of like, Oh, it might not happen to us. So, you know, like we're probably thinking, like, I'm in Toronto, my mind is scribble. like, that won't happen in Toronto, like, Toronto's so busy, Toronto's so this, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, same idea, too, where her parents just didn't think much about it, because they were in a small town, too. Um, mm-hmm. Forward a little bit more, they had brought her back to their house, and this is where it gets even more effed up and creepy. They decided to, like, blast Bob Marley and David Bowie. Mm-hmm. Why they raped, torture, and videotape this whole incident. I think the reason why I think it's more effed up is because David Bowie, if I remember, he was like, actually, no, I don't remember David Bowie. But I know Bob Marley's a very chill kind of music. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of like, that's really fucked up. You play Bob Marley? Like, really? I'm sure he would be turning his grave if he found out. I'm sure he's probably turning his grave right now. Mm. <laughs> that's so creepy. And, and David Bowie, too. Like, like, that's really up up. Yeah, so they played the music loud enough to block out Leslie's cry. They had essentially videotaped themselves torturing and sexually abusing her. At this point, Paul said, and I quote, you're doing a good job, Leslie. A damn good job. Unquote. Adding, quote, the next two hours are going to determine what I do to you. Right now, you are scoring perfect quote and the That's actual so fuck, creepy like what the actual fuck and it wasn't even funny that they actually used that line in the movie of carla as well too mm. and obviously so movie, gross. they got so even a little more like graphic with it oh my god they had basically bound her um bound her hands behind her back and they sodomized yeah they did that to her mm. And then when they were done, they locked her in a closet in the movie, at least. I'm mm-hmm. not sure what they actually end up doing in real life, but according to the movie, after they had done their thing, they locked her in the closet and it was days. Mm-hmm. It felt like days in the movie, but we don't really know obviously what happened to her, like how long she was actually held on for. But mm-hmm. from what in the movie, they they um they had her for a few days. And I think Paul was trying to drag her out for the week. So after they were done with Leslie, they, I guess they finished, like, they've had their fun with her, I guess. And in a weird so, way. Yeah. Um, so Carla had fed her a lethal dose of halcyon mm-hmm. um, while Paul added by strangling her. So then they threw her body in the basement and then the next day, they had Carla's parents over for dinner. So the body's just, like, downstairs in the basement while they're all having dinner. How fucked up is that shit? Like, oh. I wonder what Carla's parents are going through. Like, dead serious. Like, after mm-hmm. they got all this shit out, I wonder what the reaction was. I can't, I'm- I can't imagine them, like, uh, I cannot imagine them forgiving her. Um, just, like, just alone with like with what she's done to her sister, let alone like including like all the stuff she's done to other people. Like there's just I just can't imagine that they had forgiven her. Like, and I even hope, to this day. 
And I hope they don't because I don't want them to be those parents that are like, oh, my kids are so innocent. They can do no wrong. We really hope so, right? Like, at the end of the day, like, we didn't really, like, search up on the parents and who knows if there's even any information on the parents. But yeah, I just- hope they never, I hope they never forgave Carla for what she did because no matter how much she she pleads innocent there's just no way that anybody looks at this and thinks that she's innocent yeah no I hope not but yeah so after the parents have left um they actually ended up dismembering Leslie and her and then they put her remains in cement blocks and dumped her into Lake Gibson. So I don't, I'm sure it was later. Um, it was later like brought up and I'm sure like uh, Leslie's family was finally able to bury her. I was just so baffled by it, but they're already, their crimes are so severe already. And it's just like, it just keeps adding. Mm-hmm. So their next victim, again, is another 15-year-old child. Um, So they found this girl in 1992. She was walking home from Catholic school in St. Catharines, and she was approached at the entrance of the church's parking lot by Carla and Paul under the pretense of needing directions. Don't talk to strangers, kids. Right? This is why... (laughs) You don't talk to strangers. You don't give directions. You know nothing. You move on. Everyone's got a everyone's got a smartphone these days. There's absolutely no reason for anyone to ask you for directions or anything for that matter. Really, we can mm-hmm. Google anything, and mm-hmm. you can search up anything, directions, anything. Trick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, anyways, so while poor Kristen being the sweet girl that she is was providing Carla with the directions and while Paul decided to attack her from behind and force her into the car at knife point um the kidnapping was seen by several eyewitnesses so that it was interesting mm-hmm. yeah well I was surprised so, it was in broad daylight yeah it was just like that's like very out of um they were very different from what they usually did, right? Usually it was like very uh, secretive, right? Obviously they didn't want to be caught, but like to do that in broad daylight in like a public in, space. Right, in front like of that. that too. Yeah. So Kristen was held in captivity for about three days, uh, during which Carla and Paul once again videotaped themselves torturing and subjecting Kristen to sexual humiliation and degradation while forcing her to drink large amounts of alcohol. The couple actually ended up murdering her um, three days later and her naked body was found in a ditch along Burlington on April 30th, 1992, which it, which means that somehow no one spotted her body for over 10 days, which is kind of crazy, but I guess it I depends guess, like, on the ditch, right? Like how yeah, it depends. Goes. Yeah. It's so, like that sucks though. It's just like I guess at least she like they didn't do the same thing as the last victim where like their she the body was definitely not a could would not have been able to be found mm-hmm. unless they were told, right? Yes. So, so like, and also like they dismember her. So I guess yeah. You know, like maybe after the first time, they're like, maybe this is too much, so they decide to go this route instead. I mean, I don't even know what's too much for them. <laughs> like, at this well, point, like that's a well, like dismembering a body to, from what we know from like obviously all the shows and movies we watch is that it requires a lot of physical labor, right? Physical yeah. activity. So, true. like. Carla was technically, at that point, like, Carla didn't seem like a super strong lady to begin with. Um, so I'm sure, like, Paul may have gotten her to help him with, like, dismembering the body. Who knows whose idea it was? It might have actually been Vinners. Who knows, right? This is but 
This is true. And it's so crazy because like when you look at the couple, you know, you, you often think like, how, what are the chances that they literally found each other in such a perfect world, like in their perfect world, that mm-hmm. Paul, you know, unknowingly found his perfect match. And mm-hmm. Carla had this darkness inside of her that she'll always want to unleash. And there she goes and finds a man who can fulfill that darkness and, and help her with it. It's, it's so fucked up. Like, you know, like, like, obviously we know that mm-hmm. in the end, Paul used Carla for his own needs, but she also fed off of him to satisfy her own needs. Yeah. It, I think, I don't, I don't think like Carla had, so I know I say like Carla sounds like the worst out of the two of them to me, but mm-hmm. I don't think Carla started off with, um, a darkness in her per se um but i feel like she was i feel like she was definitely um she she was definitely like one of those she was just extremely selfish so it's like she was one of those people who it didn't if as long as she liked it as long as she um she wants something she doesn't care the means for it so it wasn't that so like if she could want if she if paul wasn't the person he was like if Paul was a good person. If he was someone who was generally a good person, Carla wouldn't have gone down that route because she, the, the, her, her obsession was with him for per, per, right. him only. Right. Right. And it was mainly, it was his um, obsession with like, uh, with younger women that uh, fed into what her, fed into her like jealousy or like not her jealousy, but like a little, a little bit of her jealousy but not really more of like her obsession with him right so like so the way he was fed into her obsession with him and that like just blew up Mm. even more because like I find that people with that kind of obsession tends to become even worse than the person that they're obsessed with well this is true I remember then she's like trying to please him with like different things that he may have not thought about right like I'm I feel like that dismembering thing from the previous, um, from Leslie was probably her idea because I feel like personally, I don't know them obviously, but I feel like the way that I can tell from Paul is that he enjoys the female body too much to chop it off like that. Mm, that's a good, you know, answer. so like, cause like that doesn't make sense to me for somebody like him who like, enjoys the female body like that to dismember it um especially considering that he's never done that in general so i feel i feel like that was carla's idea like just yeah. it just seemed like out of character for him i guess it's also but, we never know either because like yeah um i i do i do recall reading up on the fact that with each victim um he grew more and more violent right so mm-hmm. he was just i mean obviously Murdering someone might not be out of the question, but I feel like mm-hmm. going back to what you're saying, Carla, with not being dark, I was reading, uh, I was watching a documentary on her and they were saying that she was always sort of dark. And mm-hmm. apparently, I think, I think someone, she knew someone that had, like, had a pet that passed mm-hmm. and she had made that person dug up their grave so she can look at the dead body. Mm. And I was like, that okay. was up. like, okay there, Carla. I miss, I love playing with Barbies, but I also got a dark side to me. Hey. Well, like, she, it doesn't say how she played with the Barbies. <laughs> <laughs> this is well, true now. She just remembers her and, and limbs. Possibly. Like, we don't know that, right? Oh, this is true now. We just assume. Like, because. Yeah. We just assume she was, we just assume that she was like a nice girl, like playing along with her Barbies when she was a kid. But like, for all we know, she could have just been like popping off their their like limbs for fun and be like haha that's so funny right so yeah this is true now she's one fucked up lady with with kids like parents don't think about it much they're just like oh yeah like my kids are so weird they really don't i'm sorry but if i ever a child and my child be saying creepy shit like that to me or like you know like i see dead people or like Mm -hmm. or like mommy i think this would be so much fun if i just remember that i'm sorry that child is going therapy Mm-hmm. and being checked out and being under yeah. a watch eye and well like not all people who uh, are diagnosed with like certain things 
turn out bad, right? Like, well, no, but we want to make sure yeah. that, that they don't ever turn out bad. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely <laughs> want to know, right? You know? <laughs> I'm saying this because I knew a girl who, like, literally told me, she was like, um, oh, I was diagnosed with, like, no emotions. I, yeah. I, she, and I was just like, what? What do you mean? She's like, you know, like how serial, they say serial killers can't feel emotions? I'm like, I'm like that. I'm like, okay. That's, that's not creepy. That's good to know. <laughs> um, so <what's> <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. 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 So that, but that was interesting. And she also said that I think like someone like in the past in her family was like a Nazi member too. So I was just oh, like, yeah. you just, I was just like, you're just bringing it all up now. Okay. Okay. The girl, your nastiness yeah. and, and your no feelings. Do you think so, that maybe because like one of her family member was a Nazi that somehow, she, you know, like she was taking no, like that gift was taken away from her because to feel it's, it's a lot, you know, mm-hmm. so either like well, we're going to punish you by not giving you emotion. There's, um, there's things that in our DNA, like where things that our um, previous generations have gone through are carried through us through our DNA like you don't think about it much uh, but like um their experiences and stuff like that do go through to you in their DNA in your DNA too mm-hmm. um it's not widely it's not widely talked about but um it is something that uh they that has some studies to it mm-hmm. uh like it's it's like, for example, you know, like um, African Americans, they're a lot, you know, a, most of their ancestors went through slavery, and that was a really harsh time in their lives, right? Mm-hmm. That that is carried with them. It's not just their experience now and living in the now. It's like inside, somewhere in their DNA, they they remember that, mm-hmm. like in their body, mm-hmm. they remember those times from their previous generations. Mm. And so it's just like they're still fighting prejudice from it, like you know things like that. Because like there's there's people who, uh, but yeah, so there's people who um, have disregarded their past. Like there are people who are like that who have like said, "Well, we don't have slavery anymore. Like why are you guys like this, right?" right. But it's not you. You can't just disregard their the history that has been done. Oh, for sure. You know, and she has a so, lot of years of it too. Yeah, so it's um, so that's why I think that's also why like people are afraid of um, serial killers having children and stuff because like inwardly we, I even though we don't talk about it much inwardly we kind of kind of know it that mm. things like the things do get carried on to to the next generation. Oh. I'm not saying it always does, but like a generation. Mm-hmm. Like you never know, right? There's there's always that fight about nature versus nurture there's always uh you know like uh proof for both right so True. there's no win-win like you don't know who's gonna who's gonna go towards nature over nurture or the other or vice versa because like you and I didn't grow up together but a lot of people say we're very similar right and I'm assuming that's nature right right it's not nurture mm-hmm. so that's that's the whole like scary part about Carla having kids because then it's just like is there that darkness in her kids too or did they not go down that route are they not going to go down that route who knows right or Or, they're a little more aware of themselves because they because their mom has already gone down that route right or think that um you know how like I'm not sure what the proper term for it but you know how like because the society is already judging them and, and is already putting them into the category, even though they have not mm-hmm. committed a crime yet, do you mm-hmm. think that they could possibly even leave down that, that path where they're like, well, since y'all think I'm a serial killer anyway, because of my mom, mm-hmm. I might as well, you know, like, and I think that well, we don't know how much they know and we don't know mm-hmm. what access they have. And I'm sure with social media, social, social media and like the internet and all that stuff, it's not hard to find access to, who their mom was and who this Paul Bernard mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. Like they may be young now, but like when they're older, it's like it's not like this name. Their name 
uh, Carla Hermoka and um, Paul Bernardo is going to disappear anytime soon. Yeah. It's it's pretty etched down in history at this point. Yep. So even if they don't know it now, because I didn't know about it growing up either, I only heard about it more recently. So oh. when they're older, they're definitely going to hear about it at some point, even if they don't know now, right? This is true. But um, so it's like it depends again on nature versus nurture, right? Yeah. It's just like if they are, you know, hopefully her now husband is more responsible and trying to nurture them in the right direction. Hopefully. Um, well, he is a lawyer and uh, obviously a lot of eyes are on them. So, I mean, he is a lawyer who is married to a serial killer. <laughs> oh, so, I don't know. Like that's a whole new Oh my god, imagine if they had their own reality TV show. Oh no. Like, think about yeah. it. Like, it's funny I say this because, like, um, like you and I had talked about this before we got on to this um, episode. Mm-hmm. Where in America, all these serial killers are celebrities and they become known and they, and you know, there's like TV series, there's movies, there's all kinds of things, you know, to, to, and, and and almost like a really perfect example is Charles Manson. He was the cult leader guy. And he's such a big deal in America that even American Horror Story has a whole season on like the idea of him. And they even mm-hmm. had a character named Charles Manson in it, being him. Mm-hmm. Right? And like, mm-hmm. so it's just sort of crazy. Like a lot of the crimes that happened in America have become um, famous. And they get yeah. mentioned in a lot of stuff like you no know, American Horror Story, um, a lot of like the really popular true crime episodes, um, even like even based off of like um, a part of it in a TV series, a movie. But then in Canada, I guess is a good thing. But like the case of you know um, Paul Bernardo and um, Carla, they're like the most famous case in Toronto or in Canada that they know of per se. And obviously, mm-hmm. there were the first serial killers that was known to the world, but they're not mm-hmm. nearly as famous as um, Ted Bundy is. There's mm-hmm. no remakes of him, you know. Like they don't even have a, a TV series, and they don't have a TV document series. Like Ted Bundy, literally last year got release of this documentary. Um, it's like a, a obviously limit limit series, and then shortly after that, they released a movie with Zac Efron mm-hmm. playing Ted Bundy. Mm-hmm. Where Paul Bernardo and Carla did not get the same kind of yes, Carla got a movie, she yeah. got a movie, but but that was it. Yeah, but like I feel like that's all her words. Like I feel like they only released that because like Carla was like, oh, I need something out to like prove my innocence. Kind oh of no, thing, right? it is strictly all her words. As I'm watching it, it was very like her point of view where she's constantly playing the, playing the victim. Where she's constantly mm-hmm. feel like, like acting like she feels that Paul is forcing her, and that she apparently loved him so much that she had to do these things for him, that she had to do it, or he would leave her. And I'm sure in real life there was a lot of like you know like power play as well too, where he'll threaten to leave her if she didn't do something. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, nobody forced you to kill your sister. Nobody forced you to give your sister's virginity to this man, and nobody forced you to kill. Um, three other, uh, well, two other victims, you know, no one forced you to do any of this stuff. You yeah. did it on your own free will. And the fact that you were the bait in all of this, she was the one yeah. actually went out and found these women and brought them home to Paul. Yeah. For the most part, like some, I'm sure, like we know that some of them, he chose himself, mm-hmm. but, um, but yeah, she definitely did some of that work too. Mm-hmm. And she cannot say that it was because of him because she, physically went out and like lured these some of these women out yep. and they only came out because it was her right and also the reason why all of this fell apart was because paul started to abuse her mm-hmm. i forgot to mention that so paul started to abuse her and that's when it all kind of came out because then she filed a police report yuck 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 but then when paul um so paul abused her actually th- raped her as well too and that's when she was like well and that's where I find it kind of funny as a double standard for her, where it's okay yeah. if she hurts and abuses other woman, but the moment that is done to her, it is not okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're an Again, like it's not, that's why I was saying, like she's a selfish person, right? Oh, if yeah. it doesn't benefit her yes, in any way, then it's out the door. And the moment he tried to be physical with her like that, she's like, oh, you're not useful to me anymore. This is true now. You know? Because, again, she's a selfish person. She says that it was because she loved him. No. But I feel like the, the people who um, fall in love blindly like that, even if uh, you are abused, like because we, we know it, right? There are people yeah. who are abused in their relationships and they don't need the person because they're like, oh, I love them. Or like, oh, like um but there's there's they'll they'll like try and make excuses for them saying like oh but like they're sweet sometimes it's just like oh no they're just going through a bad day like they make excuses right yeah Yeah. but she didn't make any excuse for him she like so I feel like at the end of the day it was just all her selfishness it was it was never really about like just being in love with him Mm. um because like she can't use that excuse because that makes no sense. Abused, abused um, people in domestic abuse stay there for a while. Mm-hmm. You know, like those who are like blinded by love, they stay there for a pretty long time, like more than they should, for sure. Mm-hmm. And they don't like leave until something drastic happens or like it's been a really long time and it's just taking too much of a toll on them. Mm-hmm. And that's when they leave, right? But like, like, this lady stayed until he laid his hands on her. So... She is batshit crazy. Like, she she definitely is not um, innocent in any no. way. Like, no, they, not. she could, like, try to, like, cry her crocodile tears or whatever, but who really believes her other than her husband? Ugh, like, who, who, who truly believes that she's innocent other than her husband? <laughs> and even then, I don't even know if he actually thinks she's innocent or he's just like, oh, like, she, I mean, maybe it, when he saw her, she's like, oh, she's pretty. I'm going to, I'm going to take her for myself and you're like, going to get, get away scot-free. And I mean, just that, but like, do you not see the tapes? Like there was a mm-hmm. lot of them. Like, like when they, what I remember, so I was old enough when this case came out and I remember I was following it on the news. Uh, well, not mm-hmm. that I was following per se. Okay. That's such a lie. Cause I wasn't that old to understand what was happening, but my mom would leave the news on and every night they would talk about Paul Bernardo and his wife. And I remember they found stacks and stacks and stacks of tapes. So who knows how many more victims that they haven't even spoken about, how many more victims that they haven't even like released or named stuff too. And obviously mm-hmm. some of them might not have been released because of, you know, other reasons too, right? Like families don't want it or they're way younger age or, who knows, right? But I remember there was stacks and stacks and stacks of videotapes. Like almost every day, there was a new review of more tapes. More and more and more mm-hmm. tapes. Constantly, there was more tapes. But yeah. with that, we are going to give you guys the verdict of what happened to Paul Bernardo and Carla. So on September 1st of 1995, so it took a really long time, uh, Paul Bernardo was convicted of... A number of offense. This includes the first two degree murder murders and two aggravated sexual assaults and a sentence to life in prison without parole for at least 25 years. I am a little shocked that he only got for two murders and two um, aggressive um, sexual assault. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. he was like the Scarpo rapist. So, I mean, at least he got lifed in prison without parole for at least 25 years and apparently mm-hmm. because he's deemed very dangerous that um when it does come up i think within the next few years they will likely deny his um parole obviously Yo, his 25 years is that yeah it should be 25 years now oh, shit. they said they're not releasing him anytime soon well that's good because like this year literally this september 1st he could probably have apply oh, for his parole up. oh my god if we have any actual listeners by then we will keep you all updated <laughs> <laughs> crazy. <laughs> oh my god that is crazy and obviously we know with carla she made a deal she made a plea deal for a 12-year sentence for manslaughter and she testified against paul in his um uh, murder trial 
And of course, if y'all don't know yet, she is out free into the world, producing babies and living her best life. With I'm just trying and- to. I'm sure there's people who keep finding her and be like, you're a Carla Havoka. You and know good. She needs to be exposed. I'm sorry. Like she, like you cannot live in peace. I, I refuse to let her live in peace after all the shit mm-hmm. she's done with all of those families and all those poor victims. So good. She needs to be exposed. People need to constantly find her. We need yes, to see Please, her. everyone, find her. I love find it. Her find her and keep reminding her how much of a terrible person she is. Right. I mean, I feel bad for her kids if they turn out to be really good people, but she deserves every single exposure, hate, all of it. But you know, at the end of the day, like there, she did a lot of horrible things to people. So yep. no matter how much her kids complain about it, it's just like, Hey, your, your mom chose to do these things on her own free will. Mm-hmm. Like no one, no one forced her to do these things. She says she was forced, but like not nope. really. She, she was. She was not she forced. Was to never do anything. forced. Never. At the end of the day, no one can really force you to do anything unless they're threatening some, like threatening to do something to like your your loved ones. You know, like and she did that on her own free will too. Yeah, she 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 hurt her own loved ones herself. Yep. yep. So, like. So that says a lot about a person. I don't know. Mm-hmm. So fucked up. I still can't get over th- over that. But a side story. Mm-hmm. I actually have a friend whose trailers live so close to where they found the body parts of um, my friend. Lindsay. Yeah. He was like, my trailer was parked one street over where they found the body parts. Oh. And I was like, oh. So how I met this friend is that I work in retail. So I have this regular customer of mine that comes in and, you know, we chit chat and I tell him I like true crimes. And I, you know, I bring up Papa Nora once in a blue moon because I saw the Carla movie. And this is what he tells me. He tells me that he had a trailer park one street over where they found Leslie's body parts. That's crazy. Uh, right? How fucked up is that? Like, can you, I cannot even fathom the idea that my trailer was right there. Where this poor girl's body that was buried in cement blocks was found. That's so sad, though, for all those girls. It really is. It it truly, really is. And this is why you should never go at night alone. And never talk to strangers. Don't talk to strangers. Not worth it. Don't try to be that nice. Come on, everyone. Everyone can help themselves these days because of smartphones of the easy access we have to life compared to what we had before this is a lot easier no parent should leave their let their kids leave the house without a key <laughs> well yeah that and a cell phone and maybe find out where your kids are they're not coming home i don't know mm-hmm. like keep an eye on your kids leave the door lock maybe sit by the door be creepy with lights off drink a wine of whiskey or something like that Give your shit, give your kids hell. Like, I don't care. Wait up for them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so messed up. But anyways, with that conclude, that is another episode of Fear Feeding Friday. My name is Lena. I'm Lynn. And we'll come back to you with another episode. But for now, stay safe and look out for each other. Bye. Bye.